everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and we are gonna pick things off exactly where we left it off in the setup video for Darkest Dungeon from Mythic Games. If you haven't checked that video, you're going to want to to understand how we got everything to the table. A link's gonna show up to that in the top right-hand corner. You can click on it, watch it, and then come back here as we dive into the gameplay. The aim of this video is gonna be to show you what exploring this dungeon we've chosen to move into is like, as well as how combat works and then after that how the hamlet phase works as well. The only change between the setup video and this one was focused on the Arbalist. I'd taken a look through all of the characters and the skills I'd selected and I really liked the balance in terms of the stanzas that these skills would activate in. So as an example you can see here the Arbalist has these skills, three of them, and just above it says which stance that this character needs to be in in order to have access to that skill. So for my other characters it was a nice balance of every stance being covered so no matter where they get push or pulled on this stance track they're going to be useful however the arbalist actually had three with the exact same stance layout and i didn't like that there was three of them that had stance layouts like this now i only have two of them like this and i swapped this one out uh, which used to be there and i brought in this blind fire one here which is allowable in all four stances again i did this to try to give the arbalist some options if she happens to get pulled to the front of the row and becomes more aggressive. So with that being said, that was the only change from the setup video that I did. Now we're gonna go ahead and do what's called rolling for provisions, where every single character takes two dice, two of these white dice we did during setup. We're gonna roll them, and then we're going to put them into a common pool. So here is the result of my rolls for provision. You'll see that five sides of the six-sided provision die I represented here. We'll talk about all five of the sides you can see, and we'll talk about the one you can't as well. We'll start at the very top with one I got the most of, which is tool, and I have three tools to use. These provisions are only used to counter expiration hazards, which are traps and blockading rubble. We'll see this inside the dungeon as we move forward in the video. Very, very useful. And the next one, which I have two of, are torches. And these torches will allow you to basically increase the light track, and that's going to have some positive effects for you or take you out of the darkness, which is always good, but they can also be used to remove negative effects when you're drawing curio cards. And that's really important because you'll have opportunities to find things, but they may have a negative thing associated to them. A torch will allow you to find it without anything nasty happening. The next one just underneath of it here is a potion and that's going to allow you to remove or cure all blight or you can decide to reduce your stress by one. The next one beside it right here is for bandages. You can remove or cure all your bleed tokens or you can reduce your stress by one. And the final one that I have represented here is this one with two Ds on it and it's considered a wild. I can flip it to any side of the die. It's my choice. So I think it makes sense to flip it to the side of the die that I didn't get when I rolled originally so that I have one of at least everything. And that one new one I have flipped this die to is food and allows you to heal one. You can also use this to counter hunger during expiration. Again, we'll see this later on. Now in terms of when you can use the provision dice to your advantage, the game itself will let you know when dice can be used, but primarily they're used either during exploration or they're used during battle as a free action. And that's gonna do it. We are now ready to explore our very first dungeon. We'll be heading through corridors, exploring them, as well as running into rooms. And we're trying as our main objective here for a scout ahead to try and clear as many rooms as possible. For every two rooms we clear, we're gonna gain an XP for the party. And at the very top left of this particular quest card, you'll also note some firewood with a value associated with it. Now, not every quest will have this, but when it does, it gives you essentially eight to use to help you with stress and wounds and you are allowed to rest as an action while moving through the dungeon as long as you're in a cleared room you can choose to rest and use the allotment of eight to reduce your stress or reduce your wounds of your party you can distribute this in any way shape or form you want in order for me to remember exactly how much i have as i traverse through the dungeon i'll just use a d10 and we'll set it to eight 
So as most of you likely remember from the setup video, we have the dungeon layout right here, and we built it based on the actual quest we're doing right here. These room tiles are all flipped upside down, so I can't see what they are. They're randomly placed, and we, of course, start right here at the very beginning of the dungeon. Now, you'll see that all these doors are connected by corridors all over the place, and that's going to be part of how we're going to explore through this dungeon. There's two major things you're really going to be doing when you're moving through here. One of them is optional. The other one is all about exploring and or getting into the rooms themselves and resolving them and attempting to clear them at the end of the day for our quest and even for subsequent quests that you might pick up. So scouting, if you want to scout, the idea behind it is every single character you control, or if you're playing with multiple people, every character needs to take a single hit of stress in order to do that. And if you go ahead and do that, you can then reveal all adjacent rooms. So you could see why maybe at this point, being we're at the beginning of the dungeon, you're only going to get the benefit of being able to see the first room. Probably not the best time to use it, but later on, if we actually are sitting right in the center here where we have three connections around us, that'd be a perfect time to scout and be able to see three rooms revealed. Exploration is the biggest thing inside the dungeon because that's how you're going to move through the corridors. So when you're doing exploration, what can happen in that stage first, if you'd like, is you can discuss tactics, strategies, plan your path, change your stances in terms of how you're sitting on the stance track, and you can even consume the provisions that we rolled earlier at this point. Now again, when I'm playing solo, I'm making all the decisions, so things move even quicker because there's not as much talk back and forth between players. I know exactly what I want to do and what I'm trying to accomplish. It makes things even more streamlined. So what I'll be doing is I'm going to be trying to move straight ahead north. I want to go see that very first room. So when moving from one room to another, we're going to go ahead and roll two expiration dice, and then we're going to apply the results. And these two expiration dice are being rolled by every single player in the party. Similar to rolling for provisions when you're rolling the exploration dice, if you're playing solo, you're rolling for all of the characters in the party. So I'll be rolling for the highwayman first, and then I'm going to move through all of them. There's no order in terms of the rolling of these dice, but once you get to the results stage, when you're actually resolving what you get on the dice, then that stance track does matter in terms of positioning. So highwayman right off the top got a blank and this result. And again, I'll talk about each of the different sides of the dice as we go through. This is the Arbalist roll. Oh, that's not good. Next up, we have the Jester. And finally, we have the Grave Robber. And of course, in these situations, you really want to see a lot of blank dice. And we'll be resolving these expiration dice based on their stance order. So we'll be starting with the Grave Robber, then the Jester, then the Highwayman, and then the Arbalist. So the two dice that were rolled for the Grave Robber, one of them is fantastic. I'd love to see blank results on every single one of these dice because these exploration dice are going to hurt you. So the easy way to start is to go ahead and get those blank dice out of the way because you just saved yourself some pain. Next up, we go to the next die, and that was a Kuro is what that icon is for. It's an object of interest which is lying before the Grave Robber, and I can go ahead and pull a card in order to see what that is. Now, the Kuro is going to grant you a positive and a negative effect if I want to right now and I have to spend this right now I can spend one torch provision before I draw the card to ignore all the negative effects on it so there's going to be a card coming off here it's going to give me something positive and negative the interesting thing is you have to make a judgment call in advance as to whether or not you want to negate those negative effects or just deal with them when they pop up I'm going to go ahead and choose not to spend my torch provision in order to negate negative effects from this curio. So let's go ahead and flip it over and see what happens. The grave robber has found a bookshelf. It says a big bookshelf looms in front of you. As you reach out for a book, a spiky ornament falls onto your head as your cheek gets slashed from the impact. You look around and find a trinket on the bookshelf side. Now you only need to stop the bleeding. Now we just go top down through all of the things listed on the bookshelf. You'll notice there'll be a mix of good and bad things. The first thing says to go ahead and increase stress. So poor Grave Robber is going to take some stress for that uh, particular situation. And just below it, we're going to be gaining a negative quirk. 
The negative quirk that we gained is fragile. This is not a good one. Basically, whenever we get wounded, we get additionally wounded by one as well. Now there is a space to hold your quirks on the right hand side of the character board. So I'm gonna place this quirk over there right now. And you can only ever have a max of three quirks. There is some interesting mechanics in terms of positive and negative ones. And then once you hit that max and you get either a positive or a negative one in the future and how that works, if we hit that, I'll explain it, but it's quite interesting interesting and usually starts to lean towards things getting worse and worse the more of these you get. Next up, thanks to that ornament falling down and smashing off the grave robber's face, we are now bleeding. So you'll see I've made a stack of three number one bleeding tokens and you know how to build this stack because it'll tell you which number token to grab on the left hand side it shows a one just like it matches right there with the blood drop for bleeding and then right beside it says 3t which means three turns this will definitely matter once we get into battle in terms of the turn sequence of things so basically bad things are happening to you while you're exploring the dungeon and then of course once you get into battle that's when all these things start to trickle out now you can always try to deal with these things while exploring in the dungeon before a battle shows up. Remember I talked about things like bandages and potions, things that can help you get rid of these types of things off of you. Or I could have actually gone ahead and used a torch to negate every single negative effect here and just taken the positive one. And that leads us right to the positive one, which is the last thing on this card, which is go ahead and take a trinket. Now trinkets are extremely cool because they work in two different ways. First off, when you first equip the trinket, you get it on its positive or best side. So you can see right now I've placed it actually with the negative side facing up. We're gonna be going ahead and slotting this in. I'll do this in a second like this, but I'll be doing it on the side like so, and I'll just do it underneath the character board. So only this top portion here shows. You can see it's a critical stoner is what it says, plus two crit, which means it's gonna be easier to crit when I decide I want to go ahead and Use that critical stoner. However, once I've gone ahead and used it, I then have to take this trinket and flip it over. And the only way I'll ever be able to make use of this plus two crit again is if I go ahead and use it for this, which means I'll knock my accuracy down by two on a subsequent attack in the future. And then it will rotate back around to its positive side for me to use once again. And that's going to resolve the expiration dice that were rolled for the Grave Robber. We've got the negative quirk on the far right hand side. We've got the trinket on the left hand side. We got a little bit of bleeding going on and we're just a tad stressed out. The Jester is up next. I'll resolve the first one we haven't seen before, which is this one right here. And it's a hunger, which means the entire party is hungry. And if we don't satisfy that hunger by using from our provisions food, then we are going to each suffer two damage for each hero level we're at. So currently we're at level one, so it's still gonna be two damage each. That's pretty brutal. So I'm definitely gonna go ahead and spend my food provision here in order to satisfy this die so nothing bad happens. Now, next up is the Kiro card again. And this time around, I am going to use a torch. You might be wondering, why am I doing it this time and not the first time? Well, I was interested in showing you guys what would happen if you didn't spend a torch. I also want to keep torches, as you can see, to help us with our light level, as I mentioned. But this time around with the Jester, I wanted to do it because my Jester is actually the lowest HP character that I have. So anything bad affecting this character could really mount up to something, well, that I don't want to see. So I am going to go ahead right now and spend a torch in order to negate all negative effects that'll come off the Kiro card. The Jester has found Iron Maiden. It says a rusty Iron Maiden stands against the wall clasped shut. You feel tense as you try to open the devilish contraption. Alas, you pin yourself onto one of the spikes by accident. You curse your luck as you break free, feeling nauseous and sick. And you'll see there's a bunch of negative things there. It would have increased my stress. I would have got a negative quirk. I also would have got some bleeding, three turns worth of one bleed each. That's pretty brutal. But I get to ignore all those because I chose to use the torch and the only thing I'm taking here is a trinket. The trinket that the Jester got is the Archer's Ring. It says plus two accuracy when in the ranged position or ranged stance. Pretty awesome. Jester is right here right now, but I could eventually move uh, the individual to this spot right here to take advantage of this trinket. And then the opposite side, once I eventually use it for its positive side, on the negative side of things, in order to get it back to the positive, I'll have to take a negative one to accuracy. Moving along in stance order, the next individual is the Highwayman. You can see we got a blank result, so that's a plus. This thing is resolved right away. We have this icon here, and that represents stressful darkness. The corridor is 
so dark you can hardly see what's around you, we can spend a torch provision or reduce the light by one, or we can suffer to stress. So for me, I think in this situation, I might actually use the torch to stop this thing from moving into uh, the neck or dropping a light level. So we'll go ahead and take our final torch that we have to resolve this one. Last to resolve exploration dice in the stance order is the Arbalist. The Arbalist is now going up against two traps, one after the other, and I have to decide how I want to deal with these. If I want to try and get rid of the traps cleanly without any kind of potential damage coming my way, I can go ahead and just use a tool provision and get rid of a die. So one tool for that one, one tool for another one, and we've cleared both. However, tools can be used for other means. They can not only help you with traps, but other things you find in the dungeon while you explore, like for instance rubble and we'll see that later on because I didn't roll any rubble side of the expiration die but right now I'm going to choose for at least the very first trap not to go ahead and use a tool provision so in that case I'm going to be rolling inside the rule book it states what the crit and accuracy level is and I'm rolling against if I roll a crit 2 which means a 1 or a 2 I'm going to take 8 damage that's a ton of damage but don't worry I have that wood for resting so I potentially could deal with it that way the accuracy value goes all the way up to 8 now your accuracy value can actually be changed or dropped down if your dodge value is decent. Unlike the Arbalist, my Arbalist sadly is zero right now, so I won't be dropping that accuracy value at all. So anything up to an eight is gonna be two damage from three to eight. And then lastly, if I roll a nine or a 10, I get away scot-free, and that's kind of what I'm hoping will happen. So let's go ahead and see how the first one resolves. All right, so we got ourselves an 8. Roll right off camera. So that's still a hit, but at least it's not a crit. So that'll just be 2 damage for the very first trap. All right, I can deal with 2 damage. That's not bad. The crit is what I'm terrified of. But again, remember the HP on the Arbalist is actually really high at 14. So this is why I'm taking this gamble to hopefully resolve these traps without needing to use any tools this early in the dungeon. Let's go ahead and roll again for this next one. Cross our fingers, I get a 9 or a 10. Ah, look at that, I got a nine, so that is a miss. So no damage whatsoever for the Arbalist. Overall, I'm pretty happy with what happened. I mean, I guess technically I do take some damage from the first trap, but I was able to just hop right past that second one. So with the corridor exploration resolved, which is this connecting dotted line between the red bead and this first room, we're now gonna go ahead and reveal that first room to find out what we found in terms of a room. Ah, uh, look what we found here, a dark room. This is actually the worst place to find a dark room because a dark room is gonna reduce the light by one point when you walk into it. And you don't remove this token after it's resolved because like a trap, dark rooms never clear and heroes are going to face them every time they cross them. So we also have traps as I just alluded to inside of this dungeon. We know this because of the card that we set up. We know there's one trap sitting in here somewhere. It's something that you can't, you know, clear to get rid of you're going to constantly run into it if you backtrack into it or through it again so essentially having this dark room sitting where it is is really nasty because if we move out to deal with something over here and come back we are then going to take another hit from the light level now right now we take that hit because we are now entering into that room we cleared the corridor with the expiration we revealed the tile we enter a room our light level is instantly impacted but the key here is this thing will sit here and constantly toy with us every time we cross into it. Now I want to draw your attention up to this light track above where the stance track is and you can see right now it's on five so there's no effect we have a lot of brightness going on inside the dungeon but we're going to lower this level down to four and before I go ahead and do that I'm going to show you what that means. It states right here that monsters and heroes are now plus one crit so that means my heroes as well as the monsters we face are going to have an increased chance of hitting crits so it's an even balance it's bad for us and it's good for us at the same time and this will occur as long as we're on four or three once we get to two we're taking increased levels of stress and once we get to one 
increase levels of stress again. And then down to the very bottom, just the monsters are going to gain a plus one in accuracy and a plus one in dodge, making it tougher to hit them and easier for them to hit us. Now, I'm sure you remember earlier on when I talked about scouting as an optional action we can do inside the dungeon while we're moving through it. This is something I might want to do right now because scouting at this point, although gives every single one of my party members a single stress, we can reveal three different rooms. The benefit to doing this is when we move into one of those reveal or scouted rooms, we're only going to have to roll a single exploration die each versus two of them if we hadn't have scouted and revealed them. So I'm going to go ahead and have the highwayman take a stress. We're going to have the arbalist take a stress. The Jester is going to take a stress. Those three all take their very first stress, but the Grave Robber already took a stress earlier when the Grave Robber took a Curio card, now taking its second stress. So seeing as each of our party members has taken a point of stress, if not more in the case of the Grave Robber, let's talk about what the stress track and how it actually works. So when a hero's stress reaches 10, which basically means end of the line on the track, the hero's resolve is tested and it can either drive them into despair or boost their willpower further. You don't know whether it's going to be a pro or a con. The hero that has reached 10 on stress will go ahead with a resolve test. They're going to roll a d10. On a roll of 1 to 2, they gain a virtue. You can see an example of a virtue card right here. And on any other roll, 3 through 10, they're going to gain an affliction instead. So the chances of getting something good are quite small. The chances of getting something really bad are very high. Now a hero can have their resolve tested only once during that dungeon run and can never have more than one affliction and or virtue at the same time. Afflictions and virtues have a passive or triggered effect that takes place usually at the start of the hero's turn. After this happens, you then reset your stress meter back to zero. At the end of the quest, if a hero is afflicted, they discard the affliction and gain a negative quirk. If the hero is virtuous, they discard the virtue and gain a positive quirk. Now here's where things get a little bit scary. When a hero reaches 10 stress and has an affliction or a virtue already, they die of a heart attack. So to keep track of your stress, take the stress counter as we have done from the beginning and setup. You always keep it on the white side. You can see it's mostly black with white outlining. The final version will likely have a very white tracker. And then when it gets to 10, you're going to retreat that tracker back to zero, but you're going to flip it over to its red side instead. So if your tracker for stress is on the red side, when you return to the hamlet in between dungeons, flip it on the white side again. And basically the white and red sides are going to remind you whether you're heading towards a resolve test or a heart attack. So based on our successful scouting by every character in the party taking a stress, we have now revealed three rooms around us. And this honestly was the best case scenario in terms of scouting for this entire dungeon layout. It's the most rooms that I could possibly get for that kind of hit on stress. So it's a great time to do that. Again, scouting's optional. There'll be times where you can pull off just seeing one room or two rooms. But I mean, if you can get three, that's pretty good. Now, the one thing to note about scouting is you'll see these gray dots on the dungeon room and basically what that's going to do is break up your ability to scout down to that area. You're going to think about it like a cleared room essentially. So for instance if I happen to be in this space and I said well I want to scout because you would think you might be able to gain access to seeing this as well as this and this. You don't get to see these two. You only get to see this one as the gray dot is basically considered a room in this case and stops your ability to scout further down the dungeon. So let's go ahead and talk about the different types of rooms we just uncovered. So the one here to my west is an empty space. So basically if we happen to explore through the corridor and then enter this room, we're going to be able to just clear this easily. Basically it's like a free clear, which is nice because remember on our actual quest it says for every two rooms cleared we gain an XP. So that's a nice easy one and could be a reason to actually explore that direction to get the second one down here and then come back through, although our light level will be affected when we backtrack in there. The other option is to head to the east, although we're going through a trap. Traps are not fun because each hero is going to suffer a total of damage and or stress equal to the dungeon level. We're currently on level number one, so it would just be either a damage or a stress for each of our heroes. We'd have to decide 
which one they want to take. Now, once you get up to two, for instance, you could choose to have one damage and one stress, or two damage or two stress. So you can decide how you want to divvy that up. But the nasty thing about traps is you don't remove the room token after it's revolved. Basically, the trap room is going to sit there, it's never going to clear, and the heroes are going to have to face the trap every single time they walk through there. The room to the north of us is the Curio Room, and inside this room there is, at the center of it, something potentially good, but it's guarded by monsters. And we have to roll a d10, if we roll a 1 to a 5, we immediately initiate a battle, so there's a 50-50 chance that we jump right into a battle. If we roll a 6 to 10, the room is considered clear, and we remove the token from the board. And when the room is clear, we get to draw a Curio card and choose which hero is going to interact with it, and torches can still be used to ignore the the negative effects as we learned earlier in the video. So now knowing our options, I'm going to probably choose to take the easier path this time, being that we are level one party, we're not extremely strong yet, and uh, I guess we haven't taken too many wounds yet, so maybe we'll go off from the main area of the dungeon, which has most of the rooms over here, and we'll go down this side area here, clear the empty one for free basically, and then head down here. Again, remember when we move into this one, we're only going to have to roll one exploration die while we move through the corridor, which is a nice bonus. So let's Let's go ahead with that exploration right now. So we're going to begin exploration, which means moving through the corridor from where we currently stand in the dark room towards that empty room. So at this point in time, I can choose if I want to change the stanzas of my heroes. And based on the trinket the Jester picked up, which allows me to get a plus two accuracy boost when having the Jester in the range position, I'm definitely going to do a swap here. And just so you guys can see exactly the trinket that I was talking about from earlier in the video, it's this one right here. So having the Jester in this position based on the Archer's Ring is going to be a benefit for me. All right, and because we're going to go ahead and explore by moving down the dotted line towards this empty space, we're going to go ahead and roll some dice. And again, we're not rolling eight this time, two per character. We're only rolling one per character, thanks to the fact I've revealed or scouted this room. So we'll take one die for each character, and I'll put them in this pattern to remember which is for which. So Highwayman is going to roll first. We got a trap for the Highwayman. The Grave Robber is going to roll another trap. Oh my gosh. And then down below the Arbalist, another trap. Okay, that's insane. And then, wow. So the odds of that are actually pretty low because, again, there's only one thing on each side of the die. There's no double ups. So we got a lot of traps. This one is going to be for the Jester. All right, so we're going to start things off based on the stance track and where the Grave Robber sits at the very front. The aggressive stance means we resolve that die first. So the trap for the Grave Robber. Well, the Grave Robber's already hurting. He already has a negative quirk. Plus, he's got some bleeding going on. Do I want to use the tool provision right now to deal with this trap. It's really tempting. I have three of them. I could wash away all these traps, but then going forward, if we ever hit rubble or we hit anything else regarding traps, I have nothing. I think because we have the ability to do some healing of damage up to eight, if we get a chance to clear a room and rest, because that's the only time you can rest is when a room is clear, which is coming up soon when we get to that empty room, I might be able to handle a couple of these traps. So I'm going to try to roll and cross my fingers that things pan out for me. This is probably where things go sideways. Okay, here we go. So Grave Robber starting off first, rolling away. We got a four. Okay, so that's not a crit, because remember crit is one to two for the traps, but it is a four which lands within its accuracy. There's no dodge here uh, in terms of reducing it from the eight down any, so anything between three up to an eight is a hit for two damage. Next on the stance track is the Highwayman, so we'll resolve this trap. I'm okay with rolling for this again. There's nothing bad about the Highwayman right now in terms of anything he's got uh, on his character board, so I'm happy to roll this and hope that we can dodge it. Here we go. Oh, we got a 10, and we did dodge it. The Jester has found an Altar of Light. A small holy altar seems out of place against the backdrop of corruption. You open the small sack resting on the altar's feet, and you feel your fingers twitch, realizing the sack has been drenched in some sort of toxin. Now we're going to go ahead through all these, top to bottom. The first one means that the entire party is going to gain five treasure, so I will be placing five treasure over here with our provisions. It's shared by the group. Next one, we're going to get a positive quirk, so that's a good thing. Lots of good things on this one, but this one right here, the third one down, is is going to be one three times of this blight and that is not good that is going to do the similar thing to what bleed is doing to the grave robber in the future where it's going to bleed out over a series of turns and do damage uh, so i will be taking a stack of three ones and place them on the jester and then we're going to get a provision die which we can go ahead and roll and we'll have an extra one in our common pool so we have our stack here for blight we also gained five treasure and we're gonna go ahead and roll a provision die now see how it goes 
We got ourselves a wild, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn that wild into a torch because that's something we've been lacking and could really help us out. And last but not least, we have the Arbalist who has another trap. All the Arbalist seems to stumble into is traps, but does a pretty good job every so often, so far 50-50, of dodging them. So let's see if the die rolls in our favor this time as well. Highly unlikely, but let's try it. Oh, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. All right, so our Arbalist has dodged two traps and suffered one hit from one of the traps in the past, so that's why there's only two damage on there. So, so far, if a trap comes up, the Arbalist seems to be able to luck their way out of the situation. So our party has now moved successfully into the empty room, and as I talked about earlier, the second you move in there, it's an empty room. It automatically counts as a cleared room. We'll take the room token off, place it on our card here for the quest, just to remind ourselves we need two cleared rooms to get ourselves a party XP of one. Pretty happy with with that and now we have to decide do we want to scout while we're in this location in order to check out this room in advance uh, and be able to roll less of the exploration dice which could be a benefit or do we want to go ahead and just dive in there and see what happens but before we make that determination we are now in our very first clear room which means we are able and have gained access to be able to rest at this point which is that eight we have over here sitting on the quest card so we could technically use this eight in order to heal ourselves up which could be a useful thing to do right now so seeing as our stress is actually really really low right now overall I'm gonna go ahead and actually scout I wouldn't normally do this for just a single one but what this will allow us to do is get an idea as to whether or not we want to actually try and heal up prior to moving into this space so every single one of my characters will take one additional stress so just to sum up the scouting that I just did, every single character now has at least two stress, except for the Grave Robber that has now three stress. So we're getting up there, but we're certainly on the lower end of things that way. We found a layer, as you can see right here by scouting, and the layer is obviously full of a whole bunch of monsters. And we're gonna have to initiate a battle immediately when we move into here. And if we win the battle, we can clear this room and that will give us our second cleared room, allowing us to take one XP as a party. So seeing as we can only rest in cleared rooms, let's go ahead and take advantage of that, seeing as we know the next room we're walking into, if we'd like to, uh, we have to explore our way there, but once we enter into that, we're going to a battle. We might as well be as ready as we possibly can for that. So I'm gonna go ahead, because we have two damage on the Arbalist, and I'm gonna use two from the eight that I have here in order to get rid of this. This will drop the eight down to six. And over on the Grave Robber, I have two damage as well, so I'll heal that as well. The only thing that this Firewood will not help with in terms of resting in a cleared room is it won't deal with any type of bleeding or blights it only deals with damage or stress and you can choose how you want to divvy it up next you know we're going to be exploring as we explore towards the layer so the great thing about this before we go ahead and grab the exploration dice to roll them i have the opportunity to use my provisions to help me out and you'll remember that i do have a potion in my provisions that will cure all of my blight so i'm going to go ahead and use this potion and order to remove this entire stack of blight from the jester and that's going to clear it up completely completely. And next, we're going to take a closer look at the Grave Robber, who has three bleed stack. We want to get rid of that as well. I don't want to have any bad things going into combat. I'd like to go in there fresh and ready to fight. We're going to use bandages here in order to heal that away. So we are literally going in here with nothing negative. The only technically negative thing that we have going for us right now is this right here for the Grave Robber. This is a negative quirk. Basically, if he takes damage, he'll take an additional damage. The last thing that I'm gonna do is take the torch provision that I just recently acquired. I'm gonna spend it in order to bump the light level back up to five so we do not have to deal with the heroes or the monsters having a plus one on their crit modification. So basically, I don't really want the advantage of having the better chance of hitting a crit. If it's also gonna give the monsters a better chance of hitting me, I'd rather control that specifically through the trinkets that I have, for instance, or other effects in the game. And currently the Grave Robber has a trinket called the critical stoner which i can use to increase my crit without giving any other advantages to the monster so let's go ahead and spin that torch bump our light level all the way up to five all right with that all squared away we can begin our exploration of the corridors we head down towards the lair again this has been scouted so it is revealed so we only have to roll a single exploration die per character so we'll go ahead and do the same split we did before for each of them so the first one we'll roll for here is the highwayman see how it goes all right, we'll go ahead and roll for the Arbalist. Ah, blank. So, so far we got Rubble, a blank. This is the first time we saw a Rubble die. Ooh, not good. I wanna see blanks, come on. 
Ah, a trap over here for it, the Jester Last. So what the Grave Robber has found is called Stressful Darkness. This corridor is so dark you can hardly see what's around you. We can spend a torch provision, or we can reduce the light by one, or we can suffer to stress. So we don't have the ability to spend a torch as I literally just did it at the very beginning of the exploration phase, so I can't use it to mitigate this. However, as it mentions, I could just reduce the light level back down to where it was, or I could take two stress. So currently the Grave Robber has three stress. I could bump the Grave Robber up to five. That's getting a little bit... It's a little bit up there. It's getting up to the halfway mark or a little bit past that, but I'm gonna risk it. I'm gonna bump my stress up to five in order to deal with it. Next up, we have the Highwayman in stance order, and he got a rubble die. So blockading rubble prevents your path forward and has to be cleared out, and either your hands or a tool can make this happen. If we use a tool, of which we have three, three of them, which is quite a few, uh, we can go ahead and just clear that out no problem. If we use our hand, then we suffer a damage per hero level and a stress. So I want to avoid that. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to use that tool to just negate that rubble because I have so many of them. Next up, we have the Jester. As you can see, we have a trap. Not good, but I've been rolling decent enough with these traps to risk it. And the other thing that the Jester has, uh, which is going to help in terms of the check, which is a crit two accuracy eight, is the fact that the Jester has a dodge ability of two. And so that's gonna reduce the accuracy from eight down to six, meaning if we roll this D10 and risk it, only a seven, eight, nine, 10 is gonna do, uh, or actually seven, eight, nine, 10 is going to allow us to escape this trap without any damage happening. So the odds are not really fully under our favor yet but they're it's almost a 50 50 uh, but again you got that crit there always looming in the dark that i could land a one or a two and take eight damage on a character that only has 10 health that's pretty risky i could use the tool that would probably be the best decision but i'm going to risk it because well it's fun <laughs> at least i find it fun and so far the dice have been in my favor we'll see if that continues right now Okay, so we got it. We got and stuck a nine. That's happened a few times so far. So I gotten super lucky. Even we didn't even need the dodge. Uh, we were already going to escape this regardless. So that's pretty awesome. So long story short, nothing happens with the trap. The jester is able to just sidestep this thing like it was nothing. And last but not least, we have the arbalist. The resolution of this exploration die is very easy. It's blank. So nothing happens and that's gonna complete all the dice resolution. And just like that, our party has found themselves inside a lair. We are now going to be moving into a battle. And that's going to conclude the dungeon exploration of Darkest Dungeon. Really hope this helps you make an informed decision on the gameplay. In the next video, we're going to be diving into our very first battle, going over how that's set up and going through the full length of a battle. Hopefully we'll come out on the opposite end of this with a win, allowing us to clear that room. And at that point, we'll gain a single XP for the entire party which is pretty awesome again when we get to the last video in this series we will be going through the hamlet phase and in that phase i'll show you how the town phase works in terms of spending gold and xp and all that good stuff as well as any effects that come from the first imminent threat we picked earlier that affect the town also each of our characters in the bottom left hand corner has a very specific town power and that will come into play once we get to the hamlet phase as well Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope to see you in the next episode. And as always, keep on rolling solo.